Okay, welcome to the first lecture in Professor Selby's American Government class uh, for Ohlone College. I use it some other places as well. The first question uh, we have to ask ourselves before we get any further into class and start looking at politics and how everything takes shape the way it does, the first question we have to ask ourselves is, what is science? So this is just a very basic introduction here uh, for what is science put on the slideshow. That's very helpful. Um, I call this Selby's basic science because it can get you up and running quickly without getting too caught up in jargon and hoopla. Jargon is just, uh, you know, uh, technical words that not everybody knows and hoopla is bells and whistles that aren't actually essential to what we're trying to do. The goal of science, very important, is to try to connect cause and effect in explaining physical or social behavior. Physical behavior is things like chemical bonding, the movement of the planets, etc. Social behavior is behavior in the economy, could be religious behavior, could be family behavior, and then for us we will have political behavior. If some words get cut off where my face is, I'm sorry. It's, I've tried to keep my lectures from cutting too much off, but this is a much better version than I used to stand in front of my TV and that didn't work so well. Okay, um, let's talk about the value of science and one of the things, really what science is trying to do. Um, truth be told, naturally, intuitively, we're not very good at linking cause and effect together. There's all kinds of biases and other types of things that interfere with our ability to systematically think through some of these problems. Just a really easy basic example that's very important is what's called confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is the tendency for our brains to focus only on information that tells us what we already, uh, what we want to hear, i.e. confirms what we already think. With that, we then discount or dismiss information that, you know, could maybe show us that we're wrong. Confirmation bias is incredibly common and it's not even always bad. Uh, for example, uh, psychologists have found over and over again that one of the things that makes marriages work is actually a kind of, kind of confirmation bias. If you're happy and in love with your partner, when they do something wrong, or something you didn't like, spend money, you know, whatever it is, you discount or dismiss that, oh, they don't do it very much, it's just this one time, you know, that kind of thing. And you really focus on the things you really love about them that keeps the relationship going. So, you know, confirmation bias is definitely not always wrong or always bad. In a love relationship, it's quite helpful, actually. Uh, in a scientific method, it's a danger right? Because we need to be giving equal weight to all the evidence that we can get. This is a good article here that I've linked you to um, uh, in, in the online uh, readings. And it's really nice sort of, you know, sums up sort of some places where including medical doctors frequently fall into these types of biases as well, as much as they like to think they're so scientific and smart. Um, unless you're doing medical research, a lot of actual practicing doctors make a lot of these kinds of mistakes as well. Um, so science allows us to cut through some of the noise and to try to find some knowledge amidst all of this uncertainty. So let's talk about the parts of science. So there's three parts to science. Uh, theory, observation, and method. I will spend most of my time on theory and observation, just make a couple of small comments on method. It's there, we have to sort of be aware of it, but for what we're doing in this class, it's not terribly important. Uh, <clears throat> the most important part of science is the connection between theory and observation. So what is a theory? A theory is a rational explanation for why something happens. And so theory gives us these rational explanations and there's lots of different possible rational explanations. It's not like being rational automatically makes you right. It's just plausible. And then observation is how we test our theories. Okay, so we have multiple observations. We have competing observations 
and theory, uh, uh, multiple, we have competing theories, multiple theories, observation allows us to try to say, well, this theory does better at this and that theory does better at the other one, okay? Um, so for example, uh, gravity causes planets to move in certain ways, uh, just like the atomic structures of molecules cause atoms to bond and break apart in certain ways. So connecting cause to effect is the most important thing a theory does. So observation then is how we test our theories to see if they match reality. Most importantly, and this is critical, science relies on multiple observations in order to put together persuasive accounts of social behavior, okay, or physical behavior. One bad result, we're not going to throw a theory out and say, oh, it's false, it's wrong, why are we even talking about it, right? One bad result, we're definitely not doing that. What we might do is we might tinker with our theory a little bit, we might uh, come up with a better way of testing it, maybe our test wasn't very good, that's always a possibility. Um, so, you know, um, just keep that in mind. On the other hand, if a theory has a lot of observations that are going against it, well, then we should be wary of that theory, right? Um, and, but in science, honestly, proving something false is just as important as proving something else true. And this is actually kind of a cool way of thinking, which is, you know, it's not about being right. It's trying to sort of take out our ego from the process and trying just to figure out what the heck is going on. Without science, we don't have, you know, computers and all that great stuff. So science is really wonderful. So let's take an example of how theory and observation sort of work together. Um, the field of physics today has two main theories, theory of relativity and quantum mechanics. Theory of relativity was developed by Albert Einstein and was the major innovation in physics in the first half of the 20th century. You know, you probably heard of him. He's pretty smart. <laughs> uh, relativity explains about 98% of the physical behavior of the universe. We've been testing it and testing it and holds up pretty good. We go, wow, a lot, lot of observations here that are showing that there's something, go something going very well here, but not everything. The problem is, although a very good theory, relativity does not explain everything. Specifically, relativity does a really good job at explaining big things, how planets move and all of the cosmos and suns and the Big Bang and all of that. Uh, but it doesn't explain small stuff. And that's where quantum mechanics comes in. And so a whole generation of physicists worked on quantum mechanics after Einstein trying to sort of figure out, well, Einstein missed something. Let's try to figure that out. And they came up with quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is a great theory. <laughs> it's just as good as relativity. It explains about 90%, 98% of all the physics, including that 2% that relativity doesn't. But it still doesn't explain everything. Quantum mechanics actually leaves quite a number of things unexplained that relativity does a better job of explaining. So relativity has its own thing it can do, quantum mechanics has its own thing it can do, and they both also can explain a bunch of other stuff. Wow, that's kind of cool, actually. Um, so this is what we would call theoretical pluralism. Um, quantum mechanics and, the th and, and theory of relativity each have their own strengths and weaknesses, and we shouldn't, we can't just get rid of one of them, right? They're both very good, strong theories. They've been tested. There's lots of observations that show them to be uh, uh, valid in, 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 in important ways. What physicists today are trying to do is they're trying to discover a unified theory of physics, okay? Um, I am very skeptical they will ever find it. So far, the main contender is string theory, uh, which they're thinking might be able to hold the relativity and quantum mechanics together into one theory. But, you know, like I said, I'm very skeptical we're actually going to find one theory for everything. When that happens, you know, think of this. When that happens, when we have that one final theory, human knowledge basically stops. We've got that. We got it. Here's the theory. Okay, learn, learn the theory, right? And then there's nothing else you need to worry about but the theory. Um, 
you know, so I don't know. I'm skeptical. I actually hope that doesn't happen because I like to learn stuff and discover stuff. And when physics gets ended, I'm going to be worried. Like, huh, we, we hit the limit of our knowledge, right? There's no more knowledge to be learned. Um, second point here is that people are frequently get a little too focused on which theory is right. And they forget to focus is focus just on the advantages and disadvantages of each. So this theoretical pluralism is basically the idea or the argument that more than one theory may be a valid way of doing research. And that's definitely the case in political science. Um, the third piece of science that we're not going to talk about a lot here, but that is important, is what we call method. Method is how we gather our observations. You know, you can't see gravity. You can't see, uh, you can see the rotation of the planets and stuff, but what do you need? You need a, uh, um, what do you call them? A, uh, uh, not a stethoscope. <laughs> Whatever, those things you look into the sky with. <laughs> this is my third time recording the lecture. I gotta get through it if I mind fart. <laughs> Um, so, you know, but, uh, you can look up into the sky and you can, you, but you need to, that's your method and you need to be able to construct a way to actually see it, um, an observatory, right? So we have observatories and you got to be able to actually see it. Well, that's your method in political science. Uh, we have, um, something you may be familiar with statistical methods. Statistical methods are relatively straightforward. We can look at um, democracy worldwide, take every country that's a democracy, put it into a fancy uh, st a statistics software. It's like Excel, but the next level up of Excel where you can do some very dynamic mathematical types of things and then start looking for relationships between democracy and economic development, democracy and human rights, democracy and whatever. And you can start looking for all of these relationships. Statistical methods are great. Um, you can also have a experimental method. So in this case, and physicists like to do this or chemists like to do this as well. Um, the way political scientists do it sometimes is maybe we'll put together a little video game and have people play a video game. But of course, the video game is all set up to test their response to some type of situation that looks like what we're trying to deal with in our in our research. Right. So we, you know, put a bunch of people in front of the computer, they play the game, we see how they respond, and we say, look, in this experimental study, you know, we took 100 people, we had them play this game, and they all behaved this way, uh, or X amount behaved this way. Uh, sometimes just directly in fake situations, there was some research done um, after World War II that put people in very extreme situations trying to figure out, you know, uh, how, why did the Nazis were able to do as much as they did. Uh, third, there is a case study method. A case study is simply a very deep look at one instance, at one case, right? That's why it's called a case study. So uh, India, the nation of India, is frequently looked at in case studies on democracy because they don't fit super well the prevailing theories of democracy, right? So there's a whole bunch of other stuff here you don't really need to know. But so what do people do? They say, well, here's India. They're kind of the outlier, the, you know, the abnormality. Let's take a look at that one and see what happened there. And maybe that can give us some insight into what's going on. Um, again, method for us is less important for where we're in, we are in this class, but it helps to connect our theories to our observations. Um, last couple comments. Publicity is incredibly important in science. Okay. And without it, people frequently won't trust you. So what that means is when you're doing research, you have to share your methods, your theories, and your observations uh, in your writing. So you write it up and you explain to the reader how you did it. If someone asks for your data, you give it to them. Sometimes people don't do that, but it looks bad. You're really supposed to give over your data so that they can try to recreate or replicate is the word that scientists like to use, replicate your research. And if people can't replicate it, well, maybe you went wrong. Maybe you did your best and you just went wrong. A um, couple of final concluding thoughts on science. Uncertainty is one of the keys to science. 
science actually began as a response to certain kinds of philosoph philosophical skepticism that argued there was no knowledge we could have about the world. So that's the most important thing to keep in mind.